Welcome. I'll share a few words about CEC. We just completed a five-year strategic plan and we are implementing it this year with a foundational framework built around climate policy, climate justice, climate resilience, and climate leadership. Our leadership program is creating events like this to build a base of climate knowledge that we hope inspires you to take action. Most of you know that this is Plastic Free July. It's an annual global campaign to reduce plastic waste and CEC is a proud participant. CEC has been doing plastic reduction work for over a decade. And as we advocate for a transition to a circular economy model, we recognize that designing waste, especially plastic waste, out of the system is a key component. That's an example of a circular economy in motion. Oh, wait, sorry, I went, my slides, my slides are moving too fast. Um, CEC has been doing this work for over a decade. And so we want to um, imagine help you imagine what a circular economy looks like. Imagine that your favorite pair of jeans has worn out and you want to replace them. What if the brand took them back and made new jeans out of them? That's the example I was talking about of a circular economy in motion. And I use the textile example for two reasons. One is that according to 1% for the planet, the fashion industry is responsible for 10% of annual global carbon emissions. That's more than the airline and shipping industries combined. That's the bad news. The second reason for the denim example is that we have some textile experts on today's panel. That's the good news. Our first guest is going to share her business model and then moderate today's panel. And we really appreciate her taking on both of these roles. So I'm very pleased to introduce Carla Mora. She is the founding and managing partner at Alante Capital, a venture capital fund investing in innovative technologies that address climate change and enable a resilient, sustainable future for apparel, production, and retail. Carla has a great deal of expertise in moving toward that circular model. Welcome, Carla. Thanks, Kathy. Um, and hi, everyone. <clears throat> it is an honor to be here. I'm a huge fan of the CEC um, and what you've done for our community. So uh, I was pleased to be invited to help participate today in leading this exciting panel. Um, just to start, they asked me to give a little bit of background about what I'm doing with Alante Capital. So Alante, as I just said, is a VC fund investing in innovative technologies that address climate change and enable a resilient and sustainable future for the $3 trillion apparel and retail market. I um, launched this fund alongside my partner, Leslie Harwell, and our general partner, Eileen Fisher, the sustainable fashion pioneer um, and committed investor to circular economy. Um, so the three of us launched this about four years ago. And, and what we do is we invest in deep technologies, clean tech, consumer and enterprise software that really enable a circular economy for the fashion industry. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, we target superior financial returns alongside transformative social and environmental impact. And why that's here is just to state that what we really did here was create a venture capital fund that is a traditional VC fund, a 10 year fund looking at VC style returns, but investing in the technologies of the future, which we believe can be clean and circular and regenerative. So how do we do that? So we can go to the next slide, please. So. What does it mean to invest in a circular economy? So for us, we're looking at the tools behind the scenes that help any and all brands be able to produce in a way that we are decreasing the waste that we're creating, that we're increasing our efficiency, how we can consume better, wear things longer, and ultimately design waste out of the system. So we look here, if you look at the circle, we start with design and what types of tools can we help brands use uh, to design for zero waste? How can we right size our inventory so we're not overproducing? I'm sure a lot of you have seen the headlines over the last few years of companies like H&M and Burberry getting caught burning excess and unsold inventory simply because they made way too much. This is a design flaw. So we look at different types of technology solutions that help brands really truly understand kind of what their customer needs, what are they looking for, what size do they wear, where are they located, and how can we really design for them. Then we look at production, things like the herd coat, what you're going to hear from after this. Um, these are new biomaterials, green chemistries, uh, better dyes, ways that we can actually make product in a way that can be more sustainable or biodegradable or circular? How can we use waste as an input? 
Um, then we think about distribution with e-commerce. There's so much waste, packaging waste, um, shipping, and, and the way that we shop has become way more inefficient from ordering 20 things just to be able to keep five because you want to try it on at home. Like that model is is really inefficient and very horrible for the environment. A lot of those products end up as waste. So we invest in technologies that help to address these inefficiencies in distribution. And then ultimately we look at use and how can, as a consumer, we think about wearing things more. Wear what you have, buy, use, rent, if it's just something that you want for a wedding or you know, something really on trend, maybe there's a better way that you can participate in fashion that doesn't create waste. And then ultimately, once a product is no longer having any more utility, how can we actually recoup the, the fibers within that product and get them right back into the system? And so we look to invest in all the technologies that enable that. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, and the way we do that to make sure we're doing it in a way that works within the system is we have partnered with leading apparel companies, large and small, that have committed to circularity or sustainability and are actually putting resources to work to figuring this out. Um, we are not looking to work with only the perfect actors. We're really looking to help support the imperfect actors in figuring out how they can participate in a apparel industry that is better? How can they take steps to increase their sustainable material inputs? How can they start to offer rental and resale options to their consumers? How can we use fit technology to enable the shoppers to understand their sizing before they're making those purchases? And we work with all of these different brands through partnerships that we've created to understand their pain points and invest in the startups that are really addressing those, and then tie those two pieces together and let them you know, get off to the races through pilots and, and scaling opportunities. Um, so the next slide, please. And then I'm going to hand it over to our exciting panelists. So just to kind of see what investing for a circular economy within an industry can look like, I wanted to feature a little bit of our portfolio. So these are the six companies that we've invested in to date. Mango Materials was our first uh, very exciting company. I'm on the board there. It is a PHA, so it's a biopolymer made from waste methane gas as a feedstock that has um, the ability to be melt spun into a polyester fiber alternative, which is incredibly exciting. I'm sure many of you have seen the news around the microfiber plastic pollution problems um, that are incredibly pervasive, bound all over the environment. Um, they really create an alternative to synthetic fiber that is viable, that can be able to compete on cost, um, that can be able to compete on quality and can drop into the supply chain that already exists. We're really excited about Mango Materials. We invested um, in them with Patagonia just down the road, as well as Adidas, um, and are working with them to help connect them to different brands that are looking for a more sustainable alternative to to synthetic fiber. They're also in other industries and in other plastic. Um, they're in caps for the beauty industry. They can make films to make a plastic bag uh, alternative. They're a really exciting company. Uh, another one, just to kind of showcase the different types, we got Lizzie and Treat and Flip that are all looking at utility. They each offer in a different way rental and resale opportunities for consumers and brands to own that experience. We have Fitmatch, which is a e-commerce tool. Actually, it's an omnichannel tool for uh, brands to offer a way for consumers to get matched to the product that will actually fit them and tell them how close to fit it is and where it's not working. Um, this is an exciting piece that will help them truly understand inventory pressures so that they can start to manufacture more accurately going forward, start to design out waste. And then lastly, Cirque, was our second investment we made, and that is in a recycling technology that can break down old clothes, recover the fibers, both the cotton and the polyester, and get those back into the industry so that they can start to compete against virgin fiber and decrease dependence on land being used to grow clothes or plastic uh, being used to spin fiber. So uh, that's our fund, our circular fund in action. Um, that kind of leads me into our first panelists. So I've actually known Taylor and David, the founders of the Herdco, for quite a while. Um, Taylor was a 
student of the Bren School in the Eco Entrepreneurship Program. Um, I'm in, on that advisory council there and was a mentor early on. It's been an absolute pleasure to watch them grow their business. It's incredibly impressive and I'm very excited for you to learn about it. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Taylor and we're going to hear from the Herd Co. Thanks so much, Carla. That's a very sweet introduction. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Taylor Heisley Cook, co-founder and CEO of The Herd Co. My co-founder, David, is here as well. So we'll both be available to answer questions afterwards. Uh, and as Carla mentioned, The Herd Co. actually began at UCSB. We were master's students at the Bren School at UCSB and started as our thesis work. We launched it as a company after graduation. And as of yesterday, we've been doing it full time for two years now. So it's, it's been a wonderful journey. At the Herd Co, uh, we make it possible to make clothes from agricultural waste. Uh, I personally have a background at an apparel brand. Uh, I was in the materials and sustainability department and David has a background actually working with Carla. So we both saw the, the problem firsthand and how, how the industry is hungry for new materials. So first of all, when we reach for our favorite t-shirt, uh, most people don't really think about what it took to get that shirt into our closet or really even consider what it's made from. But the apparel industry actually relies on quite a bit of land and water every year to grow plants to make fabric. Next slide, please. And within the next 10 years or so, they're going to need twice as much of that material to keep up with demand. That is simply not possible. We don't have enough land and water to do that. And brands, fortunately, are recognizing that. Next slide, please. The industry is hungry for sustainable and closed loop materials, as Carla mentioned, that will allow them to continue making clothes and meeting customer demand without destroying the planet. And you can see some partners up there that have made, made those commitments to, to phasing out wasteful inputs into their system. Next slide, please. All right, so quick overview of fabrics that are used today. There are three main kinds of fabric used in apparel today. Natural fabrics like cotton, linen, Synthetic fabrics like polyester, acrylic, those are made from plastic, those, those fabrics. And then there are man-made cellulosic fabrics, which are better known by the highlighted names you see up there. Now, MMCs are actually the fastest growing part of the textile industry. They are projected, they're a large percentage of the market now, and they are projected to double their market share in, by 2025. So within the next four years, they're projected to double their market share. When people hear those MMC names, viscose, rayon, modal, lyocell, tencel, they often assume they're synthetic fabrics, but they're actually made from trees. Next slide. So today, over 150 million trees are cut down every year, processed into feedstock pulp, which then goes on its journey through the supply chain to become fiber and then ultimately clothing. Next slide, please. At the Herd Co, we disrupt this process by making it possible to use agricultural waste instead. So we use plant material that's normally thrown away or burned after food crops are harvested. We collect that material and we use our patented process to transform it into agrilose. Next slide. Which is the first MMC pulp made from 100% agricultural waste. Uh, it is sustainable and tree free, of course. But importantly, it's also the same quality and the same price as tree pulp. That means fiber made from our waste-based pulp is indistinguishable from fiber made from trees. And we are able to offer it cost competitive to existing tree pulp. So it does become a much easier change for brands to make within their own supply chain. Next slide, please. So of course, being tree-free is a huge part of our sustainability story, but the magic is really in our process itself. Our process is zero waste. And what we mean when we say that is we are closed loop. We're able to capture, recapture and reuse over 99% of the solvent each time we run the system. And all of our byproducts are used by sustainable manufacturing processes and partners. So we are a zero waste material made from waste, taking waste from one industry, not making any waste of our own and selling it back into, selling it into the apparel industry. On top of that, our process uses half as much water and 350 times less energy than traditional pulping technology. So even if we were to put trees into our system, it would be a more sustainable pulp, but it is important to us and of course to our customers and the industry to get away from trees as much as possible. Next slide, please. So right now we are part of Fashion for Good, which is a materials innovation acceleration program. 
uh, and we are working on developing a pilot uh, collection within their ecosystem of brands. We can announce more about that in just, just a couple months, but those debut collections will be coming in 2023. So you will be able to purchase clothes made from Agrilos in 2023. Next slide, please. And that is it. Thank you so much. Once again, I'm Taylor. David is here as well to answer questions and where the herd go. Thank you, Taylor. That was um, great to see. Uh, as many times as I've seen it, I always enjoy it. Um, so <laughs> Thanks, you. Carla. And I hope that uh, you know the audience learned a little bit about how exciting new material creation can be. Um, I had a question that came in actually right before you started. That can be good for both of us to answer. So I'll start with that and I see some more questions coming in. Um, so first was how does hemp products fit into this topic of circular apparel? So I'm going to first answer it from my perspective and then toss it over to you and you can talk about the creation thinking behind starting Herco from the beginning. So yeah. for us, hemp is awesome. I love hemp. It is a material that is less thirsty than cotton, requires less chemicals than cotton. It's a great alternative. However, it hasn't been used enough in the industry for a number of reasons. One of it, one of the reasons is just feel. The hand feel wasn't good. It wasn't um, able to be processed at, at such quantity as cotton and that's starting to change. So cottonized hemp is starting to become more available. There's a lot of innovation in the production or processing of hemp that we're seeing. Um, we're working with our partners over at Levi's. They have some public publicly facing um, collections on hemp that, that you can see out in the market now. That's been a big part of how they're addressing water dependence in their supply chain um, is looking at you know, less thirsty crops and how can we start to remove the dependence on cotton with these types of alternatives. Of course, regulation is a big challenge with hemp and where we're getting that hemp is a challenge and that's kind of changing in real time and is one of the things that David Taylor's um, business partner actually worked at Alante for a summer looking into is what's happening with hemp. So I'm going to now kick it over to Taylor and you can talk about how hemp fits into your world. Yeah, absolutely. So hemp is, so our technology works with a wide range of agricultural wastes, uh, but we are actually primarily working with hemp waste at this moment. So that's a really, really appropriate question for what we're doing. And just to talk a bit more about hemp for a, a moment, the hemp plant is a fascinating plant. It's one of the oldest industries in the world, but is a pretty new industry in this country because it was banned for so long. But when the hemp plant is harvested, uh, the seeds and are used for food, the leaves and flowers can be used to make CBD, and then the fiber on the outside of the plant, that's what's stripped off and beat up or cottonized and turned into normal hemp fabric that we all know and love. Regardless of how the hemp plant is processed, though, the innermost core of the plant, this like inner woody stalk, is thrown away or burned, or sometimes it's ground up and used as animal feed. Uh, but that is actually the material that we work with. So, and that material is called the herd. So that is that is how we started. We started figuring out we wanted to solve this waste problem in this new industry in this in this country, uh, and that that is where we got our name. So we collect that herd material and turn it into a a. Uh, a different type of fab fabric. So again, we are feeding into MMC fabric, a lyocell fabric, which feels a lot different than a hemp fabric. And as Carla, as you mentioned, I mean, traditional hemp can feel pretty rough and it has been a, 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 hur a hurdle, not to make an unintentional pun there, but like it has been a hurdle for brands to, to use that material for things um, that they want to be softer or drapier. And one of the things that, one of the products that our brand partners are interested in is actually doing a blend between our fiber that we're producing, or fiber made from our pulp and traditional hemp. So you end up with a much softer hemp based and 100% hemp based garment that behaves very differently from, from hemp fabric today. Awesome, thanks Taylor. And that answered a couple of the other questions that were popping up. So you're making a lyocell like fabric, just to make sure that was heard. Um, another yeah. question was, what about the dyes of Herdco? So you're, what, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, we we produce pulp. So we don't, the pulp is not dyed. The pulp is, well, you can see in the picture, the pulp is very white, uh, but it, we do produce a lot. It does feed into the lyocell process. So lyocell does take dye and, you know, pretty well, uh, but we, we don't, we don't do the dyes. Although the brands that we're working with are, they, you know, they tend to have very strong sustainability 
ethos. <laughs> so they do, they do tend to do very sustainable dyeing practices as well. And you mentioned that um, a hemp herd was one of the feedstocks that go into the agri-loose project. What, can you talk about a couple of others of the agricultural waste inputs? Sure, David, do you wanna take this one? Yeah, sure, hi everyone. Um, so we are also looking at corn stover and wheat straw. Those are the two main um, uh, other feedstocks we're looking at. Um, as Taylor mentioned before, you know, the technology does work with uh, a myriad of, of agricultural wastes. Um, so I think banana leaves and, and those sorts of cellulosic materials are also uh, also do fit in our in our um, future plans. Oh, great. Well, we only have quest one a little bit more time for one more question. Um, I see a two parter here. Can you give a high level explanation of your process for converting waste to man made cellulosic fiber without giving away any proprietary secrets? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? You mentioned briefly. Yeah, we a uh, high level. So at our core, basically, we are taking the cellulose out of the plant. That is what man-made cellulosics are made out of. They're made from the cellulose of the plant, so which, of course, trees have a bunch of cellulose. All plants have cellulose in different forms. What our process does, well, I guess we'll start with how it normally happens, right? Normally, you take plant material, trees, and put it into a basically a hot acid bath uh, that shreds the bonds apart and then isolates the cellulose, and you end up with other byproducts in normal pulping. Our process is different in that we've we we've figured out a, a way to do it much more gently. So we much more gently separate out the core building blocks of the plant. So there's three main building blocks that we isolate. We isolate the cellulose, of course, which is what we use. And then we also produce a very clean hemicellulose, which is like additional sugars that make plants different from each other. And then lignin, which is the glue that holds it all together. So at a, at a high level, we are use a lot less water, we use a lot less energy, we use the dramatically less acid, and we have a, a solvent that we use to more gently isolate those materials. I hope yeah. that answers the question. Yeah. Go and ahead, David. Add, um, if, you, if you were to throw agricultural waste into the traditional process, it, it would not work. The, the resulting cellulose would be damaged. Uh, it wouldn't be fit for apparel production. Awesome. That's the magic between what you guys are doing. So thanks so much for sharing that with us. Um, and we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. So thanks so much, guys. So the next person at today is Aaron Thomas, the owner of Uncommon Thrifts, which is an online store that Aaron created as a way to increase reuse. She's also done pop-ups throughout the community um, at coffee shops and uh, at other venues to help kind of spread the word that vintage is a great and sustainable alternative to buying fast fashion. Erin's also a graduate from UCSB from 2019 and is here today to talk to us about Uncommon Thrifts. Welcome. Hi, thank you, Carla, for introducing me. Um, so yeah, originally Uncommon Thrifts began my senior year at UCSB. Um, my friend Kate and I were just selling our clothing in the front yard with our housemates. Um, and from there, it kind of just turned into a passion project where I could really just take my love for thrifting, style, the environment, and share it with uh, my peers. So I realized that there was a growing interest for just thrifting, recycling, um, and sustainability in Isla Vista. Um, and thrifting was something that I've been doing since I was little with my mom. So I was really excited that there were other people around me interested in the same thing. Um, so yeah, I started the Uncommon Thrifts Instagram in 2018 and it just sort of grew from there. I met Jamie who owned the Bee Boutique um, on Pardal in Isla Vista and I was able to use the lobby space of her salon to uh, sell my vintage and used items. Um, people in the community, like friends, parents, my mom's friends, people would just started donating their clothing to me. Um, and it would give just another chance to put the, those clothes back in circulation instead of them like heading to Goodwill, which like not very much of stuff that ends up at Goodwill ends up being bought. Uh, and yeah, keeping those clothes out of the landfill too. Um, it really started out as a way to find clothes more cheaply, and I realized the environmental impact of constantly swapping the clothes that were already in circulation 
Um, I still try to incorporate fast fashion brands too in my collection and give those garments uh, more use when they typically wouldn't get that. Uh, so I began hosting and participating in small markets um, in Santa Barbara, in Goleta, and just uh, bringing the unique vintage pieces I would find in secondhand brand name clothing. Um, it was just really exciting for me. Uh, it's pretty curated. I just wrote my friends in to model for me. Uh, as of now, Uncommon Thrifts operates mostly through Instagram. Uh, the platform has been a really good way to reach consumers directly. Uh, I use it to sell the clothing, to sell home goods, spread information about the benefits of thrifting, tips on how to operate more sustainably just day to day. Uh, give other, I also give uh, other sellers a chance to showcase their work through my platform. So, so far I've hosted like three or four flea market type events that had 15 to 20 other vendors who had their own small businesses or um, just wanted to sell their own clothing. Um, but yeah, I'm also venturing into natural dyeing with organic materials like turmeric uh, to dye secondhand products to create an even longer life for those garments, as well as incorporating uh, compostable shipping materials. Uh, my goal with Uncommon Thrifts is just to continue to reach more people all throughout California because I am no longer located in Santa Barbara. I'm in the Bay Area now. Um, and just continue to participate in more in-person events as things are opening back up. Uh, it's really, yeah, just inspiring to see younger generations get excited about buying used. It's not super taboo or like gross anymore. And I just love turning people onto thrifting one piece at a time because every reused item really does make the difference. Thank you, Erin. It's uh, exciting to see. Uh, this is an area that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is resale. It's exploding in, if you're following kind of what's happening in the world of venture capital, there are just resale IPOs left and right. It's huge. And it's so exciting that the younger generation is now getting into thrifting, um, giving it to be not taboo. It's thanks to people like you who are really kind of bringing that to the communities and educating and uh, showing that increasing utility um, really is how to be sustainable and how to participate in the circular economy. So um, thank you for that. It's exciting to see. I hope I can come to one of your pop-ups um, when you're back. Um, let's see, do we have any questions here? Excellent. So thinking about, um, brands that are participating in a circular economy. You're helping to create any brand. So even if they weren't sustainable from the beginning, you're helping to increase their, the length of their lifespan, which enables them to be participating in this circular economy. Um, beyond that, are there specific brands that you personally support because of their commitments to sustainability or circularity? Um. Honestly, I thrift so much that I have a hard time when I'm buying anything new. I don't even really know where to start. Um, there's a company called Los Angeles, Los Angeles Apparel, and I have been buying from them. They're really um, outspoken about how well they treat their workers, where their garments come from. Um, so that's a company that I really like. Um, other than that, I really, yeah, I don't pay much much attention to new brands yeah mm -hmm. cool and so one of the challenges with buying used is fit um you know there's not like seven sizes of the same thing like you'd find in retail stores so is there um someone that you send them to if someone wants something do you do any changes to the garment you were talking a little bit about dyeing garments that have stains how are you kind of increasing the life or, or maybe updating pieces to be more modern yeah, so I learned how to sew last year. So I have not yet sewn anything for anyone else, but I've given the option before for when I um, am selling an item through Instagram or even in person offering like to alter it or even giving them ideas on how to. I also have friends who have asked me, like I'm looking for this kind of piece specifically, can you keep an eye out? And I know that vintage clothing isn't always like size inclusive either. And I think that that deters people from going to the thrift store because they can't find anything that's necessarily in their size. 
So I try to keep that in mind when I'm there because I try to have the patience to sift through everything at the thrift store and keeping um, everybody in mind when I'm there and trying to be more inclusive with that. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been great to learn about. Uh, we are actually now going to shift gears a little bit. So thank you, Erin. Um, but actually, I'm going to help answer one other question on the apparel side before we switch over to our second part of this panel, which leaves apparel industry a little bit. Um, and that is, from a circular economy perspective, what are currently the best companies to purchase clothing from? And I'm going to second Aaron on where what you have, <laughs> where used, where what's already been created. After that, um, there are lots of good brands out there that are, are are really pioneering um, when it comes from about integrating sustainable fibers and materials. You can look to Patagonia and the work that they've done, Eileen Fisher, um, but there are lots of also small and emerging designers that are popping up. There is a company called Wearwell, shopwearwell.com, that is kind of like a stitch fix for ethical brands. Um, and they also have a circular aspect to it where you can sell back your products and buy used. Um, and it's a place that you can start to find sustainable brands that fit your body type, your preference, your, um, you know, how much you want to spend on clothes and your ethics. So there's a lot of resources out there. Happy to share more after, but that's one question. And then the last question are brands that use recycled synthetic materials, a good option for workout clothes. I know microplastics are still an issue. Yes. So that is everywhere. You'll see, you know, recycled plastic bottles are the new fiber for um, replacing traditional virgin polyester. And you'll see that kind of advertised across from Lululemon to, you know, everywhere in the mall. And um, I think that this is, you know, what is available now and brands should be offering that um, at a minimum. And I think it's kind of the polyester solution 1.0, and we're going to start to see a lot of better alternatives soon. Um, things like mango materials, synthetic fiber alternative that will actually biodegrade um, without leaving any type of a plastic uh, powder into the environment. So yes, recycled poly from plastic bottles still create microplastic pollution. Um, but they're a step in the right direction. One of the good things is that they've really led the charge in enabling brands to tell a story around sustainability and circularity that has gotten a lot more consumers to start to think about that um, when it comes to apparel shopping. So, you know, imperfect, but a good step. All right. So with that, I think we've got the questions answered and we're going to go ahead and move on to the next part of our presentation. Now we get to hear from a uh, very cool consumer um, brand. It's offering healthy food sourced responsibly and delivered without plastic. So that is Sun and & Swell. And we're going to hear from Kate Flynn, the co-founder of Sun & Swell. So I'll turn it over to you, Kate. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kate. I'm the co-founder of Sun & Swell, along with um, Brian, who's also on this call. And um, our mission at Sun & Swell is to make it easier for you to eat healthy and more sustainably. Um, our, we're trying to help transition the grocery industry, the packaged food industry away from single use plastic. And we're trying to help bring you closer to the source of your foods. We really believe people should know what farms their foods are coming from and who their farmers are and whatnot. Um, before I tell you more about our business today, I wanted to walk you a little bit through about through our journey of how we got to where we are today because we didn't start thinking about circularity in the food industry. Um, we evolved here as we started to pull back the layers of the food industry. So um, just to, like, so we're all on the same ground. We're, we're in the world of packaged foods. So if you walk through the aisles of the grocery stores, all those foods in plastic, like that's the world that we're playing in. So when we started our company several years ago, um, that uh, that's that's uh, me working out of the Goodland Kitchen for those who are local. That's where we started. We now have our own um, uh, manufacturing facility and an awesome team uh, down in Ventura. Um, but uh, anyways, when we started, our mission was really just to bring healthy snack foods to the market. Um, snack foods that were sourced responsibly with good ingredients and using only real food ingredients. And um, that was our focus. And we 
uh, if you can see on the picture of our right, that's our, you, you, if you um, live locally or in Southern California, you've probably maybe seen our snacks around. We're at Whole Foods, we're in a bunch of coffee shops, um, places like that. Um, we brought our snacks to the market. We started to have a lot of initial traction and we were so excited with where we were going. However, something really wasn't feeling right. And that was that we were selling our, our snacks in single use plastic, which is the norm of the industry. It's what 99.9% .9 of the industry is doing unless people are selling in like cardboard or something like that. Um, but these are grab and go snacks, you know, they're, they're, uh, and what happened with us is there was like a moment when um, we, this picture right here, this is right after we see, received our first round of custom packaging. And that's like this huge milestone moment as a snack food brand. We worked our, like our butts off for a year to grow big enough to be able to order all this custom packaging. It shows up and we're like, oh my gosh, we have this beautiful packaging. But then it's also this moment where it's like, oh my gosh, we're a business with a lot of buying power. And we just created like 20,000 bags of single use plastic just for sun and swell. And it was a really kind of um, pivotal moment for us where we said like, we have to find a better solution. So we started to explore, I, I did a lot of Googling and I discovered that there's actually compostable packaging that exists that looks and feels just like plastic packaging. It can be, it can be shaped the same. Um, it can have like, everything's the same except it's compostable. And instead of questioning, like, why is nobody else in the industry using this? I just said, we're going to do this. We're transitioning. Uh, let's just go. So we made the decision to transition all of our packaging over to compostable. If you go to the next page, um, you can see this on the left. That is our, a compostable um, version of our snack pouch. It looks beautiful, right? Um, what we quickly learned after launching all of these snack packs and compostable is that there's a reason why people aren't using compostable in the grocery industry right now. And that's because the compostable packaging itself has a shelf life as it should, it's compostable. But that means when it shows up on grocery store shelves after going through warehouse and truck and warehouse and truck sitting in a back room and then going to sit on a shelf, it starts to degrade. And on the right, you can see a picture of, um, this is a, this is like one of our friends was in San Francisco, found us in this cool coffee shop and sent it to us. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is what our product is looking like when it's sitting out there in these compostable bags. And you can see in that orange bag, it's like wrinkly. The window has completely fogged over. Um, what you can't see is that the layers of the packaging are pulling apart. And we just, we really, um, the business went through like a really hard point because we started losing accounts. We were losing shelf space. Things were starting to slow down because when you see a beautiful plastic bag on a shelf next to like a wrinkly, crinkly, dull colored bag, like the one you have in that right hand picture, um, you're not going to buy, you don't know that's compostable. You don't, and consumers don't assume that's compostable. And so what happened was we just started to see sales slow down, started to create a lot of food waste because we weren't selling our products in our wholesale accounts. So we were um, stuck in this position where we're like, okay, we, we basically realized that the traditional grocery industry, the way it's set up, the traditional packaged food industry, the way it's set up today is not ready to take compostable packaging. That's why none of the big brands are using it, even though te the technology exists. So we thought, is there a way that we can start um, working with compostable packaging in a way that uh, doesn't go through the traditional system because the traditional system clearly isn't ready for it. This is really just like an overview, try, trying to show a simplistic way of what we thought about. Basically, um, if you look at a traditional model for groceries, there's all these middlemen involved. It goes from the farm, different suppliers, packagers, like sits and distributors. It's a really long supply chain. So what we, try, what we said is if we wanna use plastic free packaging, we know we can use it. We just really have to shorten the supply chain. So it's not going through all these channels and then sitting on a shelf. And so we ended up um, pivoting most of our business to an online, like a direct to consumer model an e-commerce model. And this allows us to use compostable packaging and sell it to, directly to consumers in a way that works perfectly. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to show on the bottom. It's like, we uh, haven't talked a lot about sourcing our ingredients, but we try to source directly from farms. We manufacture everything in house. We ship everything ourselves um, direct to consumer. That's about, and that's now about 80% of our business. Um, if you flip, flip to the next slide, what you can see is that like, we went from selling a little bag of snacks to this is just showing like, we now have tons of different products um, to fill your pantry. 
um, all in uh, compostable bags. Um, and this is kind of like, and these, this is like our online offering. And this is our way to really try to offer consumers a way to have like a plastic free pantry, a pantry without, um, without plastic in it. Um, we really truly believe in an ideal world. There'd be no role at all for packaged foods. Like we wish packaged foods didn't exist, that everybody could go to like their local farmer's markets or that there'd be really easy, like, you know, zero waste stores on every corner that we could go to. Um, but that's not the world that everybody's living in today. That's not the reality for most people. So what we're saying is if you are going to buy packaged foods, we want to give you the best option possible. We want your ingredients sourced from farms. We want to tell you where they're coming from. And we want it to be in packaging that's not going to sit um, in landfills for tens and thousands of years. Um, and uh, just, just, in, just in case not everyone knows on the call, normal packaging, I, I should have covered this earlier, but normal food packaging is not recyclable. Even if it's a recyclable plastic bag, um, it's usually recyclable number two, and that's not curbside recyclable. So you have to go to special drop-off bins. So really like package, most of the packaging here, uh, package, plastic packaged food is not getting um, recycled. So we want to give, we want to give people like an option if you're buying packaged foods for a, a way to like use a more sustainable packaging. So um, anyways, so uh, we launched all this. We we're super excited about it. And then we started realizing and doing some digging that it doesn't end with just like giving consumers an option to buy pack, uh, food and compostable packaging. We realized that the end of life of that compostable packaging is another huge issue. So um, most, a lot of industrial uh, compost facilities, even so if you're lucky enough to live near an industrial compost facility, a lot of them don't even take anything other than food scraps. Um, so that's an issue. Like even if you could buy our bags and you live near an industrial compost facility, maybe your industrial compost facility won't take them. Um, another thing is like, you know, it's it just, it's, uh, some people have home compost, others don't. So what we wanted to do is, um, allow people figure out an option for people to make sure they can compost their bags, even if they don't have access to composting themselves. And so that's when we launched um, our send back program to really help like try to close the loop um, with our food. So if you go to the next slide, um, our goal, like what we're working on building and what um, we're, we're doing, but just um, what we're starting to scratch the surface with is that people, um, you know, something like an almond, it's grown on a farm, we package it in compostable packaging, and then it ultimately gets turned back into soil that goes back to farms. Um, so we needed to figure out a way to help enable people to ensure their compostable bags are turning back into soil. So we launched our send back program um, about nine months ago. And basically you just, if you're, if you're shopping on our website, you can buy these comp uh, our send back bags. They're just envelopes. Um, you can fit up to 40 of our empty packages in them. You can send them back to us and then we'll ensure they get composted. Um, and that really helps us like close the loop with um, for our bags, because we really want to make sure they get composted. That's the main like one of the biggest reasons why we're why we're selling them in um, compostable packaging. Um, so right now this is we're I, you know right now we're doing this um, on our website, but the vision for this program is to really grow in a much bigger way um, in two ways. First of all, we want to like just be able to scale this program. And what we're, where we're really targeting um, some of our efforts right now is trying to find really large partners like universities or corporate offices, um, uh, stadiums, places that do really large volumes and getting them to participate in this program with us. So um, buying our snacks and compostable packaging, um, selling them there and then like helping, we'll ensure that their bags actually get composted. If we, if we can do that on a much bigger scale, we can have a much bigger impact. We still don't think compostable packaging is ready to go through like the grocery channel, but it could go through a university if we were working directly with them or a corporate office or something like that. Um, the other way we think about growing this like uh, send back end of life program is if we could uh, potentially like uh, do like a B2B offering where we let other brands selling food and compostable packaging also partner with us so we can collect their bags too. So if you think about like, kind of like if anyone's familiar with like ThreadUp, ThreadUp's a like online marketplace from a consumer point of view, but they also have a big B2B program. That's kind of how we think about um, 
that's kind of how we think about that. Um, and um, yeah, I think another, I, I think, I think that's basically it. I think just like another major, major point that like, I want to, I know this has been brought up a couple times, but like that, I think it's the most important thing that we need to remember as like, leaders, but like in this space, but also like consumers should remember when they're talking to or looking at businesses is this really is about progress over perfection. Um, we still sell 20% of our products in plastic packaging because that's going through wholesale channels. And we know if we sell it in compostable, it's going to turn into food waste because it's not going to sell. Like we've been through that. We've tried it. Um, and we are going to be like limiting our growth of a brand. We won't be able to ever achieve like this big these big changes we want to make in the food industry um, if we limit ourselves to only selling on our website. Um, so we have to have partners outside of our website as a food brand. Like we just have to, we don't, we have to drive awareness of our brand. We have to get our brand out there, but we know that it's not like the traditional channels aren't ready for this type of packaging. And so um, that's really hard for us. Like we really, Brian and I really struggle with that. Um, we're, I mean, like, sadly, we're like ashamed of it. Like, I don't like it, but it's like, we're still doing so much right. And we like have to give ourselves grace for that. And, um, I think that's been a really, a, a journey for us to get our head around as founders, but also, um, just opening And, uh, also I think a, a really important lens to think of as a consumer, like you don't have to do all things right, but you can do like one thing, right. And just start making steps in the right direction and pushing the industry forward and making a lot of noise about it and things will follow. Thanks so much, Kate. That was um, really inspiring and it definitely moved me. I am so impressed that you guys took the challenge of packaging and actually evolved your business model around that. I mean, that's no easy task. Yeah. Um, when you did that and you chose to shorten your supply chain and do direct to consumer and push more online, um, was there a big hit that the business took? I mean, did consumers know how to shop that way? Did you have to increase your marketing budget? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we definitely had to reach. Um, so there's, I, we, we have two different, so at the end of the day, we're health food. Like we're, a health, we're selling healthy foods. So um, for our, cons our consumers who are already shopping us, already buying like our healthy snacks, it was kind of like a value add, like, oh, like now I can buy. And they had already, a lot of them had already been along the sustainability journey with us because we had launched Compostable and then we pulled that. Like, so a lot of them were already along that ride with us. Um, but when it comes to, um, when it comes to like the marketing, like we definitely are now also targeting a new type of consumer who's more focused on sustainability, but, but, and it's like, oh, it's sustainable and it's healthy. And yeah, it was, it was a big marketing push. Um, we didn't take a hit from it. And that's what encouraged us to keep going. It actually like quickly took off. And it was, we found it was way easier to communicate like what we were doing and how we were different because nobody else is doing this. Um, versus like when we were selling healthy foods, like we know why we're different, but it's hard for a consumer to understand like why your healthy foods are better than other healthy foods. And without tasting it, they don't know how delicious it is and things like that. So um, one of the reasons we really, we really beta tested this about a year ago. And when it started to, when we started to get the positive feedback, we're like, okay, keep going, keep going. And um, just really grew it from there. That's awesome. I love it. Um, one other question. Oh, are you guys uh, keeping an eye on the innovation happening in packaging? It's something that we look at a lot and there are, you know, innovators that are actively trying to address the problem that you saw happen. Compostable packaging that could still be high quality and shelf stable, but, you know, compost in your backyard. So how yeah. are you staying like on top of what's coming? Yeah. So the main, the main way we're really close with our suppliers. So we have, um, we work with three different suppliers in this space. Um, and two of them are from my point of view, like the most, uh, really leading edge when it comes to like packaged food to be used in a grocery setting. And so, um, we're kind of, they're always keeping us up to date and like, we're iterating with them. So, um, at one point we were like, should we, should we, ha should we like develop our own packaging? And we're like, that's just great. Like there's so many people that are like really working on intensely. So our strategy has been partner with the people who are making it that live and breathe it every second of their day and have them help educate us. And that's one of the most interesting things I think we learned along this process is even our suppliers, they're still learning. 
So they don't know how every single food is going to, every food reacts differently when it's in compostable packaging. It's like, it's like we've had over 60 years or 80 years or whatever to, to really lock down everything we need to know about plastic packaging in the food world. Um, but we're just learning about the comp plastic pa uh, compostable packaging in the food world. And um, even our suppliers are, it's a journey for them too. And they don't have all the answers either. Awesome. Well, I love it. And I have some exciting innovation in plastic packaging that I'd love to send you after this. So we'll follow up. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Thank you for what you're doing. This has been great. Um, okay. Well, that actually brings us to the end of our panel. Uh, I think we've gotten all of the questions answered. We have one more. Actually, this comes back to the apparel side of things. What happens to the clothes that you can drop off at the recycling center? Um, well, for the most part now, and depending on where you are, I don't know if there's someone else that wants to answer this question, but it ends up being um, put down into the rag trading industry. So typically they get shredded um, either by a mechanical recycling and they get used for insulation for housing. So it's downcycled or cut up to be used for rags and shipped overseas um, to do that. So it's not the most efficient uh, way to deal with it. Certainly not closing the loop in apparel, but it is managing a lot of waste. Um, so yeah, hope that answered. Happy to answer any more. Kathy, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Carla. And thank you to our wonderful panelists for those great presentations and also to you um, on the attendee side for asking so many great questions and I'm glad we were able to get to so many of them discussion. Now we're going to do our lightning round that lets our panelists answer a few key questions really quickly so I'll invite the panelists to uh, take that um, put up yay so we can see everyone's faces and we'll just go around i will go around as i see you on my screen um, and our first question in our lightning round is what is your favorite eco shopping habit and taylor you're to my right so i'll start with you all right well um my favorite eco shopping habit i mean i read clothing labels i know this is this is a thing that i did not used to do until i got into the clothing space though uh, because oftentimes you you try on a top or a dress and say does it fit can i afford it great then i'm good but now i've become pretty uh pretty committed to reading clothing labels and only buying from certain certain fibers um so happy to go into more detail on what fibers I choose to buy from if we have time but I know this is a lightning round so I'll let somebody else oh <laughs> if you should a couple I, should of examples I, that'd be great <laughs> sure 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 so I try to buy organic cotton when possible uh I do you know if I, I I really don't wear much polyester I just I don't really like the way it feels uh but if I do if something does have polyester in it uh I try to buy from a reputable brand that I feel like they have a responsible supply chain for making that polyester um and uh, also look for recycled polyester. That's always better than virgin polyester. In terms of man-made cellulosics, which I am very intimately familiar with, of course, I, I try to buy lyocell instead of rayon or viscose because uh, lyocell is made in a, a more environmentally sustainable way. And then again, this sort of goes back to a question that you answered earlier, Carla, uh, in terms of brands that I like to buy from. Uh, I do have a certain number of brands that I, I do do my homework before purchasing from a brand to make sure that they they have uh, good good practices in terms of their own supply chain and sourcing. That's great advice, and I, I'm starting to see a lot more recycled polyester. So I'm glad to hear that that is something that is okay and that it's not just a greenwashing term. So good to know. Um, thank you, Aaron. You're next in the circle that I can see. What is your favorite eco shopping habit? My favorite eco shopping habit is, of course thrifting um yeah just always thrifting i use thrift stores to buy like home goods dishware like there are even places like i know somewhere up here it's called uh urban ore in berkeley and it's you could find anything there like building goods you could find literally anything anything from clothing to plants to just anything so definitely buying used Wonderful. Berkeley is great for those kinds of resources, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Brian, what about you? Uh, well, I don't buy a ton of clothes, but when I do, I um, 
I find it really easy to find a lot of great companies in town here in Santa Barbara and around the area. Um, and now that I know about Taylor's, uh, what she's doing, um, it's one more uh, great example. But, um, you know, I think about like Toad Co, Patagonia, obviously, um, buying secondhand if I can. Uh, but the one thing I really love to do when it comes to just my everyday shop, like shopping habits is just using my one per this one percent for the planet uh mirror mug and taking that to the coffee shops because i still like to go to coffee coffee shops and i know there's a lot of single use there um but you can still experience great coffee or great tea and every time i use that mug i just feel like man i just took took one out of the system there so um that's a great thing for me it gives me a lot of satisfaction and pride to be able to use use my special my special mug every day i do that Wonderful. Yes. And it's, it's nice that 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 is a habit that is backed in, in acceptance because uh, there was a while during the pandemic that yeah. we weren't able to do that. Yeah. And even if there is still like, even during kind of some of those tough times, if you're kind of cool with them, they'll, they'll still, you know, hold it with really high and like, let you do it if you ask them. So I, even though the sign on the door might've said otherwise. Um, so yeah, I, I was uh, pretty persistent about it. Good for you. Thanks. Kate, what about you? So my shopping tip comes um, in the world of food, of course. So uh, obviously try to buy local as much as possible, but that's not an option for many things. So I encourage you when you're shopping in the grocery store and buying things in packages, um, to flip over the labels and see where they come from. Some foods are not grown in America and that's okay if you still want to eat them, but there's a lot of foods that are grown in the U.S but most things on the market aren't from the US. So um, just, I would challenge you to start understanding how far across the world your food is coming from and um, really reading that, that label on the back of the package. Excellent, yeah. The carbon footprint of miles is not something to be overlooked for sure. Um, and last but not least, Carla. Um, let's see, I have quite a few. In January, 2020, before the world went how it did, um, my family made a commitment to end single use within our household. So um, we had already done quite a lot of that, saving jars, and that was like, you know, how we keep our food that we've cooked or things like that. We got stasher bags and we got, we gave them to everyone in the family for Christmas. And we had gave each other enough where we could actually just no longer need plastic bags. So that's been a big help. So while we kind of failed in 2020 in terms of, you know, having to use plastic in grocery shopping or cups at the coffee shop, um, you know, we did a really good job at, at phasing out in the house. So that was something. And then I always look at utility, just like, how can we just get the most utility of what we have? Can I wear this a million times? Can I fix it? Can I buy thrift, you know, before buying anything new? And then when I do buy new, I buy fewer, better items. So spend my money on something that's timeless and that's high quality that'll wear forever and interchangeable instead of something that's just like fast fashion. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you all. Okay, next question. And this is feeding into some of the questions that we're getting about tips on spotting greenwashing in products. So if you want to incorporate that into your answer for this one, you're welcome, which is, um, do you have advice for consumers looking to connect with the circular economy? And we've, we've, we've run through a lot of examples today. So if you have any quick other advice, um, we'll start, we'll go in the same order. So Taylor. You're up. Oh man, I'm going first again. Okay, so <laughs> I think I think you know the examples that everyone just gave of different ways to you know vote with your money in terms of the circular economy, make those make those conscious decisions. I think that's the the best way to engage with the circular economy as a consumer, uh, and just try to I mean come to events like this, get educated, learn about what what you, what happens to your products at the end of life. But there you know there's only so much people can can do without without knowing what what they can do so yeah i think you know just making mindful decisions um and attending events like like you're all doing right now good job this is a good first step and i'll pass it along because i think somebody else might have something more useful to say on this one that's really good thank you and yeah we do we have a very engaged and as you can see in the chat a wonderful group that is sharing a lot of resources and 
um, we will, we will um, just so you all know, we, we, we're taking note of all the resources that our panelists are sharing outside of what they do and what you're sharing. And we will send those when we send our recording link out to you. So I think there'll be a long resource list this time, thanks to all of this robust conversation. Um, Aaron, what about you? What advice do you have? Um, maybe outside of thrifting, we know, we know that that's, that's your key thing, but are there any other things that you do that, that have a circular economy? Um, focus or that you want to engage in now that you've heard more here? Yeah, I would just say shopping local is usually the most sustainable way to shop, like uh, Kate was saying. Um, yeah, like trying to shop as much as you can at farmers markets and small businesses and just supporting the people that are in your community because that also means just overall everything's more local. You don't have to drive as far things don't need to be shipped to you. So just, yeah, trying to buy as close to home as possible. Perfect, love that. Brian? Um, I, so for me, um, I, I like to, to lean on my, uh, my younger employees who also are Bren School graduates, recent ones, by the way. Uh, and they're amazing when it comes to learning about uh, you know, anything around sustainability, circularity, um, there's so much more plugged in to a lot of this stuff than even I am. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, finding that person around you who younger people, especially are just great resources for being able to, to learn from. As well as all of you today. So thank you for that, Kate. I actually have a book recommendation, um, one I just read that I think is a really um, good one for anyone trying to just dive deeper into the world of um, circularity. It's called A Waste Free World by Ron Gonin. And it's a really great, um, it just covers a lot, like the history of plastics and all examples of companies. And um, yeah, I think it's really great for just lear learning more. I'm writing that down right now, and we will share that <laughs> in our resource list as well. That so and Carla? Yeah, let's see. I think a resource that's helped me in my kind of learning about circular economy is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And they recently put out a report on the circular economy and kind of learning just about what it is and how to participate. I can put it in the um, there in the chat. Um, but yeah, that's been a good resource. And I think just in practice, just decreasing waste whenever possible and reusing as much as you can and not being upset if you're not perfect and going to farmer's markets or going to sprouts or places where you can buy things out of package. I stopped going to Trader Joe's a while ago, um, just cause I was so frustrated that everything was in a freaking plastic container, these clamshells that can't be recycled here. So, you know, even just going to sprouts and filling my heart with vegetables and throwing them in a paper bag like that helps so anything we can do definitely thank you um so we'll we'll finish our lightning round real quick here um with our just very simple but kind of loaded question of what gives you hope for the future uh taylor sorry i'll start with you again no happy to happy to answer so i mean I have a lot of hope for the future. I think events like this give me a lot of hope for the future, just seeing what everyone else is doing out there to make a difference. Uh, being in the space, you know, seeing how how committed brands actually are to making a change, that gives me a lot of, a lot of hope for the future. Uh, and, you know, as Aaron was saying, the, the, the younger generations are very excited about the, you know, they're very committed and very, um, they're voting with their, their dollars they're walking the walk and talking the talk uh, to, to make these changes. So th those three things give me a lot of hope for the future. Love it, thank you. Erin? Yeah, just to echo Taylor, uh, definitely young people being more interested in uh, just making choices that'll positively impact the environment. Um, and that that pressure is becoming more normal too. There's a lot more pressure from the public on bigger companies to be more eco-friendly. Um, and yeah, that's happening more and more. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Brian? I think the business, the, the young business community, just in general, especially around this area, California, Southern California, Northern California, uh, venture capitalists that are deciding to start funds to get involved with 
um, thinking about new way, you know, circularity. For, it, I'm, I'm surprised by how many funds have popped up recently that just focus on that concept. It's amazing. Um, I think there's so much optimism in what's going on in the business world right now as, and um, with younger brands like all of the ones on this panel here that are starting and looking at problems in a new way. And it's so easy to get frustrated when you look at the political system and trying to do things, th you know, I know CAC uh, does amazing work on that end, but um, it can be frustrating sometimes for just the, the individual, you know, when you're, you're trying to just get a straw band or bag band, um, but businesses can do things a lot faster and more and just try things. And, um, and I'm really excited by what I'm seeing, I, I think is a lot of reason to be optimistic. And if you look around and start trying to find some of these brands, uh, it's really, really exciting times for sure. Absolutely. Kate? Yeah, I think one is um, echoing a couple of people. I think definitely I'm, I'm in a lot of founder circles, a lot of like I, I pitch competition, like all, all these things where I'm constantly like around new founders and it blows my mind how I think every single new business, like I come across as some sort of sustainability focus, either in a really big way, or at least they're being thoughtful about things. And that's really awesome to see. Um, I think another thing is just like, um, a passion that we have from our customers who are like so supportive and grateful for what we're doing. And it's like, as we spend, this is like all we, we like live and breathe this and like to see that like people actually care and want, want it and, um, are voting with their dollar. Like that's just really like on an everyday basis. It's just really amazing and uplifting. And, um, we're really grateful for that. Wonderful. Thank you. Finally, Carla. Um, well, I am a venture capitalist, so I am inherently incredibly optimistic because <laughs> um, I believe the future can be different and will be, and it will be greener and more sustainable and hopefully circular. Um, so what really leads me to waking up every morning and doing my job is these entrepreneurs who are so inspiring because they don't really see obstacles they see like opportunities to be creative and think differently and bring new innovation to life to solve our problems and so um yeah it's like these people on this panel that get me super excited and that make me optimistic got a wonderful note to end on thanks again to all of you um really enjoyed this session today and thanks to all of you for sticking with us and we went a little bit over time but there was so much to discuss and i think we got to a lot of your questions which was great we are going to ask you a couple more questions now um our our participants um we have a some closing poll questions that will pop up on your screen and those your responses to these questions will help us guide topics for future events. So we're very grateful for your response to that. Um, and please join me in thanking today's wonderful moderator and presenter, Carla Mora from Alante Capital, and our amazing panelists, Kate and Brian Flynn from Sun and Swell Foods, Taylor Heisley Cook from The Herd Co., and Aaron Thomas from Uncommon Thrift. So we're really grateful to, to you all for giving us your time and your incredibly positive energy today. Um, and we've heard this quote a few different ways today. I'm just going to use it to finish up with sustainability isn't about one person doing it perfectly. It's about millions of people doing it imperfectly. And I think you definitely heard that reinforced by people here today who, who know what they're talking about. And also, we, as we heard today, we can vote for that future that we want to see with our wallets. And we've been given some really nice examples of that today as well. Um, and we are very pleased to announce that as of yesterday, you may not have heard this, the Plastics Free California initiative will be on the November 2022 ballot. This initiative will provide funds to reduce waste, shift the cost of recycling to companies, abate litter and create that more circular economy. So follow CEC on socials and, and I'm sure that we will be sharing more information about this as that election draws nearer. We do wanna thank our sponsors today, Marburg Industries, Cox Communications and Bye Bye Mattress. Look for a follow-up email in the next few days for a recording of this webinar and all of the amazing resources. We'll get as many of them in as we can fit. And free events like this are just one of the ways that CEC works to advance rapid and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. CEC is one of only five nonprofits in Santa Barbara County to hold the highest ratings possible on both Charity Navigator and GuideStar. You can support CEC's critical work by texting GIVE to 805-600-3360 or visit cecsd.org forward slash give. 
thank you again so much for joining us and we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Have a great day.